Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much indeed for taking part in this, in this course on faith and globalization. Um, thank you, first of all, uh, for not sniggering when I was introduced as a professor, like last year's class did, uh, which means that you are either A, more courteous, or B, uh, um, less percipient. Um, but uh, I want to thank very much Miroslav for his incredible collaboration with me, which I've really enjoyed, and Doug for what is a fascinating introduction, leaving it a bit up in the air there at the end. <laughs> you know, Huntington, basically, it's the end of the world, or is it? Uh, I don't know, time's run out. Uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Uh, so first of all, let me just, uh, a few words about, about the foundation. It, I, I started the Tony Blair Faith Foundation because uh, I believe, for the reasons I'll, I'll, I'll give you in a moment, that faith matters is of fundamental importance to understanding the modern world, um, but also because I, uh, I had a more subjective desire in mind as well, which is to stress the value of faith in the modern world and how faith could be a, a force for progress and for reason and for conflict resolution rather than division, sectarianism, violence, and so on. Uh, it's partly also because I think for a lot of people today, they, they yearn for spirituality. They don't always find it in organized religion. They don't always find it in the, in the way that organized religion behaves. So I think this, the concept of faith and its place in the world today is of fundamental importance. Macy Mod for me, is a former political leader to say that. But you know what's strange is very often um, people I, I meet outside politics think it's a little bizarre that I've taken up this as, as a major part of my new life. Uh, funnily enough, former colleagues I speak to who are political leaders think it's entirely sensible. Um, and that's because they're dealing with real life situations every day in which these issues to do with faith uh, and actually faith and globalization matter. Um, now for this Yale course, we, we wanted to create an academic course that dealt with these these issues and dealt them with them not as um, faith is about theology, and then you've got um, you know your grand strategies and political affairs, and the two things are separate. We wanted to bring them together. We thought that there was a, a necessary study there of how the two interrelate, um, and this is the second year we've done this at Yale. But now we're doing this in other universities throughout the world, and our, our, our desire in the end is to build up. Uh, core group of 12 internationally renowned universities uh, where this course is taught and then we want a whole lot of things to spin off from that. So you guys, and, you know, you're part of something at the beginning, but believe me, it's going to be <laughs> big in the end. Uh, and um, so there is the National University of Singapore that is, that is now taking this up in Durham in the UK. Uh, there's other universities in Canada. Actually, we're in discussion with universities in China now and in other parts of the world. And we want this to be a, um, a genuinely global course. And the fascinating thing is that we are finding no closed doors, very open doors, uh, and if anything, competition in different countries as to who should come and participate in this. And I'm not arrogant enough to think this is to do with me. I actually think it's to do with the fact that if you take any day's news and look through the newspapers, you can see the issues to do with faith and politics and how it interrelates to an increasingly global community there manifest. Now, um, so my basic view is if you can't understand the world of faith today, whether you're in business or in public affairs or in politics, you actually can't understand the world. That's the importance of the course. Now, just to demonstrate this, we, 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 we had some slides that um, we, we put together, which are just, there's just very few of them, but I'll, I'll, I'll run you through them because it's a basic factual uh, substratum, if you like, to this, to this debate and leads on quite neatly from what uh, Doug and Miroslav have just been saying. Five billion people in the world own up to some form of religious affiliation. Um, Actually, as the world's population increases, so will the numbers of Christians and Muslims and Hindus and others. Um, but the other thing that is interesting is the dramatic increase in international migration. 
in other words, what's happening is the world is, is moving closer together, and that is basically, as I'll say in a moment, what globalization does. And then if you look at the next slide, which is taken from the Gallup poll about the importance of religion, and uh, it's a little difficult to see from parts of this, but actually um, what this shows you, the darker parts are the most religious, uh, you might be quite surprised um, to look at a less religious place that is the United States of America, but that is only relative. Uh, when the polling was done on how important was religion to your life, is it important or very important, the figures actually, I think, were quite remarkable. Um, in the UK and in Europe, it was just over 30%. Which some people said, well, that's not much. Actually, if you think of a third of the population thinks religion is important or very important in their lives, it's really quite a lot. Uh, in America, the figure is just over 60%. But in many parts of the developing world, and say Brazil and Africa for Christians, but really throughout the Muslim world, the figures are over 90%. Uh, now, that shows you, I think, if you think of a country in which over 90% of the population are saying religion is important or very important to me, I think you make the case fairly easily that uh, religion matters. Actually, not surveyed in this was China, and I'll say some words about that in a, in a moment, because I actually think what's happening in respect of religion in China is also interesting. Um, and then you get the two sides of it, religion for good or for bad. Uh, you see increasingly negative views, for example, of Jews in Europe and of Muslims in Europe. What is quite interesting, I think, about this is that in Britain and in the US, which you might expect this to be different, actually, the negative views of Muslims are less than in other parts of Europe, which I think is quite interesting. But so in some of the Western countries, um, there are some developing hostile views towards those of particular religious faiths. But the other thing is, if you look at religious conflict, actually there are not many conflicts in the world today in which religion is not playing a part, or at least is something of a dimension. Um, and I think it's virtually impossible to look at certainly any of the points of conflict in the Middle East without understanding the importance that religion plays in those conflicts. And yet, um, as we saw from the conference actually we held yesterday here, which was about faith-based organizations helping in development and global poverty, faith-based organizations also do immense good. So you see a lot of the, the, the better educational outcomes, health outcomes that are being delivered in some of the poorest parts of the world are being delivered by faith-based organizations. So the conclusion of that is regardless of your own belief system, background, intellectual interest, and future plans, to understand the world in which we live, you need to understand religion. And then a quote from uh, the chief rabbi of the UK, Jonathan Sachs, the world faces a global phenomena whose reach is broader and in some respects deeper than the nation state. So that's kind of by way of why, wh why is this important? Why should we be worried about it? And let me pick up on um, some of the things that Miroslav and, and Doug were just saying. Globalization uh, is, a, is a term that we, we use to cover many things, but I, I sometimes think in, certainly in practical political life, it's best to try and keep things relatively simple because actually your understanding is then greater. Really what globalization is doing is it's just it's pushing the world together. Now you can debate that and some people will say, well, it's not really, and some people will qualify it by saying this and saying that, but actually that is really what's happening. Um, and it is a hugely powerful voice and force. I mean, it's transforming societies and countries. It has enormous opportunities, and it has drawbacks and dangers. But the thing that I think is most important of all to say about globalization is that it is driven by people. There is a misconception sometimes that globalization is a force essentially driven by governments. Actually, it's not. If you look at what's driving globalization, which is the internet, mass communication, uh, mass travel, 
the thing that brings a lot of you from different parts of the world here in Yale is choice. People are making choices. Right? So it's people that are driving this force of globalization. And that is very important, incidentally. Because if government is doing something against the will of the people, it can often be eventually stopped. But the will of the people is very hard to stop. And it is individual choices by individual people that is producing this process of globalization. And just to give you an example of how that then changes countries and societies, when we did the, um, the bid for Britain to win the, the right to host the Olympics in 2012, um, we had to make a presentation as a country. And it was one of these interesting moments where you, d you have to st stand back and think of how you're going to sum up your own country and your own city. It was London that was bidding. And the first presentation I was given was very much about, you know, London, Buckingham Palace, the Houses of Parliament, the, you know, all the rich history of Britain and so on and so forth. Uh, and when I thought about it, and thought about the London in which my kids were growing up, I thought, actually, you know, that is not the most interesting thing about, that's the most obvious thing about London, so it's not the most interesting thing. The most interesting thing is London is today a place where you have people from different races, cultures, ethnic backgrounds, and they mix together, and they live together, and actually, basically, they thrive together, pretty much. And interestingly, when we had, literally the day after we won the Olympic bid, the, the, the terrorist acts in London and, and bombs, the interesting thing was the response of Londoners was to come together, not to fall apart, which was a, a reaction that was produced by the fact that actually most people were living and working alongside each other and coexisting peacefully. But it was an interesting r reflection on the type of country we'd been, and that, you know, that's the force of globalization. I mean, London, major financial center, major meeting place for people, that's what globalization is doing. It's pushing people together. Now, when that happens, there is a natural reaction, because with it comes enormous change. You know, and actually, Britain, again, is an example of this. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, when we started to get immigration, and immigration not from white people, but got immigration from black people, it caused trouble and difficulties. How much is that? Five minutes. I'm not in charge, am I? You're in charge. <laughs> okay. Um, and right, I have to speed up a little bit. Um, but what happened was, I mean, in the end, we over, overcame that, that fear. But what is that about? And it's the same process with globalization now. It's fear because of there's change. It's fear because there's a, a sense of loss of control. Right? Things are, that are usual but are replaced by things that are unusual or different. But most of all, it's a loss of identity. People feel that they're, what, how they felt themselves and how they felt the community and society around them has changed. And people then feel in a faith sense that my truth and the truth that I've grown up with is suddenly challenged because your truth comes alongside it. And what this does, this force of globalization, it therefore forces us also to confront the nature of our faith. And I want to suggest to you that religion has three coexisting elements, religious faith, um, that sometimes are combined, but sometimes you can see very distinctly. This first religion is tradition. This is how we grew up. Right? Our parents were this way, we're this way. You know, it can be a bit like uh, voting patterns. You know? This is my my parents voted this way, I've always voted this way, this is our vote. So it's tradition. Religion is, is just part of basic tradition. The secondly, religion as identity. And this is really, I think, the concern that underlay the Huntington thesis, that religion identifies me, it makes me, makes me feel that I belong. Right? It's how I identify myself. I am a Christian, I am a Muslim, I'm a Hindu, that's how I identify myself. But then there's a third aspect, which is faith around certain values. And what is interesting there is that faith around certain values tends to be values 
that are common across the face and that people share. And that personally, I think most people, if they decide they haven't grown up by tradition, they don't see it as a matter of identity, but they make a conscious choice to become religious, most people do so because there are certain values in the faith that are, appeal to them. So my father, in fact, was a convinced atheist, and still is. I mean, we get on fine, he's convinced Tory too. But, uh, <laughs> so I know, it's a great act of rebellion. Uh, uh, but, I only hope it doesn't affect my kids the other way. But it's, um, you know, that, for, for, for me, the reason I was drawn, I was drawn to Christianity at the same time as drawn to politics, but I was drawn not on the basis of some piece of the theological minutiae, but because I felt that the Christian faith representing as it did to me, um, at its best, compassion, love of neighbor, uh, a belief in social justice, that, that drew me in. That's what I would call religion as values. Now, it's often a mixture of all of those things. People can be religious because, um, because of tradition, because of identity, and because of values. But I think when you look at how people behave as people of faith towards people of other faith, then it becomes quite important, which is the predominant view that you have of why you are a religious person. And that's why, you know, for example, um, sometimes people used to say to me in respect of Northern Ireland, and they say it also in respect of the work I do now in Israel and Palestine, they say it's not religious, this dispute. It's got nothing to do with religion. And I said, well, that's a bit strange because I'm afraid that the people engaged in the dispute think it has. Um, and, you know, it can't be entirely coincidental that this group were Protestant, this group were Catholic. Uh, you, when I'm in my office in Jerusalem now and I just look out of the window and I'm right on the edge between East and West Jerusalem, you know, you see the people, and very obviously Orthodox Jewish guy, you see the people very obviously who are Muslim, and the women particularly, dressed um, in, in, uh, in the way that they choose to do as Muslims. So religion matters. It can be for good or for ill. It can pull us apart. Or it can be a force for good. And it relates to globalization also in this way, that this force of globalization, as it pushes us together, the question is, does faith become then a force that pulls you apart, or can it, in fact, be a force that does the opposite? That because of values to do with love of neighbor, a sense of justice, a sense of community, a sense of the other, can it be not just a, a force for peaceful coexistence, but also a humanizing force for the process of globalization itself. So can it teach us through love of neighbor to respect difference? And can it teach us through values that globalization without justice will lead to pain and misery for the majority and even war? Right, final thing, final, final thing. I spent a week in China recently, and it's very interesting. I mean, it's a fascinating and exciting place to be, of course. What is interesting is that there is this huge process of economic development going on. Hundreds of millions of people have got to be lifted from poor farming, subsistence farming. 60% of the population is still in farming. You've got to be lifted into an industrialized economy. And the concern of China, obviously, is that the gap now between an East Coast that is very wealthy and, and an interior Western subsistence economy on farming, that gap is very broad. So you can see globalization at work there very easily. I mean, it's going on every day, every city, every town. Interesting thing is, especially now, 60 years into the People's Republic of China, the 1949 revolution, is a sense that people in China want to see their history not just as the 60 years of the revolution, but as the thousands of years of the civilization behind it. And what you find increasingly in speeches made by Chinese leaders, or I was at a conference down as uh, uh, one of the, the 
poorer provinces in Guizhou, a place called Guiyang, uh, listening to speeches. It was interesting, the number of speakers, we were talking about the environment, actually, and climate change, who mentioned the traditions of Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism. Uh, the governor of the province was a Muslim. Right? Uh, the discussions I were having were also with some people who were Christians. Now, that, I think, is an interesting you know, closing point for, for the, to begin our discussion. That you, faith does matter. The force of globalization is driven by people. It is pushing the world together. The question is, does faith become the means of reaction or the means of progress? And this concept of faith answers something very deep within people, which contrary to what people might have thought in the West, is not diminishing in the era of globalization. In other words, this idea that as people get better off or they start to globalize on, and industrialize, that they give up on faith, on the contrary. People's deep-seated yearning for some spiritual dimension, for some grounding of this pro economic process and some values is actually profound and real, and if anything, increasing rather than diminishing. <laughs>